My name is Robert Zanger, and I'm president of the new Albert Hoffman Foundation. This is indeed a historic occasion for modern consciousness research for a number of reasons. Um, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the first synthesis of LSD by Dr. Hoffman in 1938. It also marks the inauguration of the new Albert Hoffman Foundation, which will be dedicated to preserving the psychedelic research that's been done over the last 50 years. And for a third reason, because just a few weeks ago, LSD has been legalized in Switzerland for use in psychotherapy. This is something that Dr. Hoffman will be telling you more about himself uh, later in the program when he gives his presentation. At this time, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the evening and our MC for the rest of the program. Uh, he's a lecturer, an extremely articulate and poetic speaker, as many of you know, a shamanologist, an expert on psychoactive plants and medicinal plants from around the world, director of the Botanical Dimensions Foundation in Hawaii. Please welcome Terence McKenna. to see so many people here tonight to celebrate an event like this. Talking about 50 years of consciousness research in America reminds me a little bit of the story that's told of Mahatma Gandhi when he was asked what did he think of Western civilization and he said it sounds like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> because, as a matter of fact, uh, consciousness research in America has been severely stifled over the last 35, 40 years. Science is invited to uh, look deeply into all aspects of nature except the nature of the self. And yet, clearly, a crowd like this, an event like this, indicates that uh, this issue will not die. This issue is not going to go away. And so, it's wonderfully fitting, I think, that we bring Dr. Hoffman from his bastion in neutral Switzerland to the city of Lost Angels to celebrate what was one of the great seminal events in the history of the 20th century. You know, Newton was asked of his theory of gravitation, how could he ever have made this leap of imagination? And Newton said, it was very easy. I stood on the shoulders of giants. And everyone who has done psychedelic research, research on consciousness in America, has stood on the shoulders of giants. People like Robert Gordon Wasson, the discoverer of the magic mushrooms in Mexico, the man who propounded and founded the field of ethnobotany. People like Richard Evan Schultes, who is an advisor to the Hoffman Library and the great ethnobotanist of the 20th century. And without doubt, people like Albert Hoffman, people who, laboring in the confines of their laboratories, have thrown open the doorway to new worlds 
of possibility for the human spirit. Tonight, as Dr. Hoffman was receiving the accolades of the crowd for the invention of LSD, I couldn't help but think to myself that he probably never dreamed that the search for a better vaginal constrictor would carry him so far. <laughs> So, I'm going to keep my remarks brief this evening. I think a visit by Albert Hoffman to America, the foundation of a library that bears his name, that will serve as an archive for the research that has been locked away in filing cabinets and packing boxes for 30 years, and in concert with the political situation in the society, the larger society around us, is a sufficient reason for pausing for a moment and actually considering what is the psychedelic experience, what promise does it hold for a sane future for our planet and our children, and what is it about it that kindles the kind of loyalty that I feel coming from the people in this room this evening. And I submit to you that it is nothing less than the rebirth of a voice that has been silent for at least a thousand years. The still small voice of the logos of the planet you know, the Old Testament says you don't have to study the difference between good and evil. You know it. The still small voice in your heart elucidates the correct way to live. And in Western culture, this still small voice has been stilled for over a millennia. And we have operated in a world that is reductionist, objectivist, materialistic, secular, male-dominated, stressing stasis, stressing the minute particulars in favor of the great overarching picture. And in some way, we have lost our way. And it remained for giants of 20th century thought, like Freud and Jung, to announce the startling fact that there was a human unconscious. And then it took still a different generation of researchers with a different set of analytical skills to take the concepts of the unconscious and turn it into a frontier full of challenge, to a topological manifold that courageous minds could sail out into to map and to explore. And squarely then, in the path of the materialist, reductionist, crypto-fascist dreams of high-tech industrialism, there emerged... <laughs> there emerged a mystery. The last thing you would expect. A true mystery. Now, Dr. Hoffman has been lauded here this evening for his invention of LSD. Certainly, this is what he will be remembered for over the long centuries ahead. But as a matter of fact, he is a thinker of extreme breadth and depth. It was he, working with Carl Ruck and Gordon Wasson, who proposed that it was actually psychoactive ergot alkaloids that lay behind the Eleusinian mysteries and thereby rub the nose of classical scholarship in the fact that the foundation and the wellspring of the Western imagination, which was the mystery cults of ancient Greece, that that foundation is firmly rooted in a psychedelic experience. That when we leave these things behind, we leave behind our cultural birthright, no less than when the Amazonian Indian deserts his home village for the sawmills. We too were once tribal people who lived in the light 
of mysteries that came to us mediated by shamans and created out of the magic of the natural world. It was Albert Hoffman who synthesized psilocybin for the first time and described its absolute structural characteristics. This is a man who is astride both the synthetic and natural product chemistry of the 20th century like no one else. His research has revealed the unexpected fact that there are biodynamic alkaloids in our environment, in our food chain, indeed in our history, that argue that we are the bearers of a great promise, that the future of consciousness can be endlessly bright. In any age, this message would have tremendous impact but it is particularly poignant in our own age because we live in an age of global crisis. And the crisis is not that there is not enough food. There is. The crisis is not that we are victims of warfare and propaganda. We are. But the crisis is rooted in our own minds. It's a crisis of point of view, a crisis of psychology, a crisis that requires a new look at the human enterprise. And I submit to you that there is no faster, clearer, and cleaner way to get a new look at the human enterprise than by availing yourself of the tools and the compounds which men like John Lilly, Albert Hoffman, Richard Schultes, Gordon Wasson, Oscar Janiger have placed before us. Don't let anyone tell you that we're not living in an age of heroes, because we are. These people have set a standard that will be difficult to follow. These people, when it was for God's sake controversial to be a communist, dared to give people LSD, dared to suggest that a new world of the mind might lay right ahead of us. And so I think it's very fitting that the Albert Hoffman Library be an ongoing project, a, a project that the community can rally around and see itself reflected in. We're living in an age where people have an in, who have an interest in these things are marked as escapists, pariahs, cultural anarchists, ne'er-do-wells, hedonists. Look at the people around you. <laughs> Did any of you watch the Republican convention? <clears throat> So I submit to you that what we represent is a fifth column, a fifth column that represents the best aspirations that human community is capable of, a fifth column that is willing to look at the structure of the psyche in contrast to the, the mess of society and willing to dream I'm reminded of William Faulkner in his Nobel address. He said, man will not simply endure, man will prevail. Now, of course, he should have said humanity, but this was years ago. But the thought is there. We have the tools, the intellect, the will to create a caring global culture. It isn't going to come without a recognition of the power of the psychedelic experience. The psychedelic experience is the birthright of every human being on the planet. It is as much a basic part of each and every one of us as our sexuality, our, our national identity, our consciousness of self. And any society which attempts to hold back or impede this dimension of self-expression, when the history of that society is written, it will be called barbarous. 
the movement toward legitimizing psychedelics i see as part of the broader movement throughout human history that gave us the magna carta the bill of rights women's suffrage in the future it will be unimaginable that governments once regulated the substances that people use to explore personal growth it is the mark of a barbarous culture and we are here to raise a light to say truth is not so easily swept aside one doesn't just say no to truth truth <laughs> truth requires engagement it requires courage it requires a sense of where we have been and of where we are going and what is preached all around us is the quick fix the fast buck the temporary solution the throw away and disposable culture that ends up throwing away and disposing of human lives and what we place against that is a humanism that does not rise out of theory it's a humanism that rises out of experience the experience that informed the great mystics of every religion is not something that we strain for throughout a life of self-discipline and self-subjugation that isn't it it is our birthright each of us Dr. Hoffman and his discoveries place this dimension within the reach of all of us. Dr. Hoffman and his discoveries place this dimension on a social agenda that cannot be denied, that will not wait. If not now, when? If not us, who? It's that simple. We are moving now, I think, unfortunately, into yet a darker political night in terms of the larger society around us. And I make an analogy to the coming of the Dark Ages. But what the Dark Ages promoted that is going to work in our favor were monastic gatherings of like-minded people who preserved information through the time of darkness and social ignorance toward a new day when it could be utilized to mitigate the suffering of men and women everywhere LSD is to my mind first and foremost the greatest medical discovery of the 20th century and I use it in the sense of ameliorating pain creating caring promoting unity healing not so much of the individual psyche although certainly its impact in that dimension is tremendous but ultimately as a deconditioning agent allowing us to move beyond the confines of historical society to see what we could be what we have been and what in fact we have the energy to be in the future thank you very much okay. so I'm doing double duty up here tonight as MC as well and I want to introduce the next speaker he's an extremely eminent psychologist researcher long on the scene there at the beginning he his work with dreams at Maimonides Hospital set him on a lifelong course of the study of consciousness he has published extensively on shamanism he is a teacher lecturer mentor and all-around great guy please welcome to the podium Dr. Stanley Krippner. Thank you very much, Terence, and thank you very much for such a brilliant introductory talk. Well, 
some of you remember that when Albert Hoffman wrote his autobiography, he called it LSD, My Problem Child. I have news for you, Albert. LSD was not your only problem child. Many of your problem children are here tonight. <laughs> and I think you will be very proud of us before the night is over. Now, I'm going to discuss the way that Albert Hoffman and his work have influenced the whole field of consciousness studies. And I'm going to use the term consciousness to refer to a person or other organism's pattern of perceptual, cognitive, affective functioning, either on an everyday, ordinary basis, or in so-called altered or alternative states. The field of consciousness studies includes descriptive, experimental, and theoretical approaches to the investigation of these patterns of functioning. Emphasis also is placed on relating phenomenological techniques to the measurement of externally observable behavior as well as to abstract model building. At Saybrook Institute Graduate School, where I teach, we have one of the few carefully thought out sequences of courses in consciousness studies at any accredited university in the United States. And, Albert, you'll be happy to know that at Saybrook we don't keep interest in psychedelics in the closet. Students write dissertations on the topic, they write papers on the topic, they contribute articles and chapters to monographs and books, and you are certainly, to us at Saybrook, a great cultural and scientific hero. Now, consciousness studies were neglected by most psychologists for several decades, but they began to emerge under the impact of developments in psychopharmacology, such as the discovery of LSD and related compounds, but also developments in neuropsychology, engineering psychology, sensory deprivation studies, and the discovery that rapid eye movements during sleep were quantitatively related to dream reports. The latter investigations demonstrated that objective and subjective methods could be combined in consciousness studies. Research in hypnosis, meditation, and mind-altering drugs suggested ways in which changes in sensory processing and cognition could be investigated in laboratory settings. Biofeedback terminology and technology demonstrated that many internal states could be monitored and could be regulated voluntarily. Transpersonal approaches to psychology have brought Eastern models of consciousness to the attention of Western investigators. As a result of these wide-ranging developments, a new introspectionism emerged in the study of spontaneous fantasy, daydreaming, imagery, and creativity. Data from studies of memory, attention, learning, and cognitive styles indicated the need to determine how awareness influences sensory input and motor output. Neuropsychological research produced data concerning the functioning of the two cortical hemispheres, as well as the role played by neurotransmitters in regulating behavior. As the scientific study of behavior experience and intentionality, humanistic psychology has assisted in the rediscovery of what William James called the stream of consciousness as a proper area of investigation. The groundwork was prepared for the advent of the scientific exploration of consciousness five decades ago when Albert Hoffman synthesized a lysergic acid compound known as LSD-25. Initial trials were disappointing. It did not seem to have any medical use and did not appear to have psychoactive properties with animals. But there was something puzzling and curious about LSD-25, and in 1943 Hoffman investigated again. He accidentally absorbed some of it through his skin and had what he later called a dreamlike but not disagreeable experience. Albert always has the talent for understatement. <laughs> Three days later, Hoffman arranged to take what he believed to be a very weak dose. He tried to take notes in his laboratory journal, but after a few pages, found out that he could not write anymore. <laughs> so he headed for home on a bicycle. <laughs> Why? Because automobile use was restricted in Switzerland during the Second World War, which was then raging through most of the rest of Europe. Even though aspects of his bicycle ride were terrifying, Albert realized that he had made an important discovery because no known substance in the world would have any effect at all in such a small dosage, one quarter of a milligram. Hoffman called a physician. But by the time the good doctor arrived, 
he had begun to enjoy the experience. <laughs> the endless variety of colors, the happiness, the rapture, and the feeling that he had come back to life. Eventually, Albert Hoffman decided to explore the new drug in a setting outside the conventional laboratory and had what he considered to be the first psychedelic LSD experience in 1951. Joining him were the pharmacologist Herbert Nazif and the novelist Ernst Jünger. Again, he took a low dose of the substance, but found himself transported to North Africa among the Berber tribes, enjoying beautiful landscapes and exotic oases, while a Mozart record played music from above. <laughs> and some time later, Albert had his first religious LSD experience, having a confrontation with death and feeling that he had left the ordinary world forever. Fortunately for us, he came back. <laughs> Hoffman became convinced that LSD could be important for psychotherapy, for treating the terminally ill, for brain research, and as an adjunct to meditation. But he also concluded that it should only be given to people who were prepared for it, to people who had strong psychological structures. He once commented, and I agree with him, I thought of LSD as being appropriate for an elite, for artists, writers, and philosophers. Hoffman's work with LSD was responsible for an invitation to investigate the pharmacological properties of the Mexican mushrooms used in sacred rituals before the arrival of the Europeans. By this time, Hoffman was director of research for the Sandoz Pharmaceuticals Department of Natural Products. Chemical studies of the mushroom by French and American firms had ended inconclusively, so Hoffman was eager to accept the challenge. And this and other stories come through in his book, Plant of the Gods. Origins of Hallucinogenic Use, co-authored with Richard Evans Schutes. Well, Hoffman was later to note that the earlier investigations had used animals as subjects. But Hoffman, having learned that humans have a greater sensitivity to psychedelic substances, ate the mushrooms himself. See, this was very radical at this time, to try something out on yourself. Who would have thought of that? Who would have thought that that would be science? In 1958, he reported the results of his studies, having isolated the active ingredients of the sacred mushrooms, two new substances which he named psilocybin and psilocin. And a few years ago, uh, Walter Houston Clark, who is with us tonight, and I and some other people went to Mexico for an interview with Maria Sabina in the last few years of her life and saw firsthand the setting in which some of the early explorers like Wasson and Hoffman had observed firsthand the workings of the sacred mushrooms. Well, Hoffman was later to synthesize the active ingredients of rye ergot, squill, psychoactive morning glory seeds, and rewolfia. These investigations led to the production of several important medicines. He also made a retrospective study of the Eleusinian mysteries of ancient Greece, producing compelling evidence that a psychoactive substance, probably rye erga, was used at the climax of the initiation, and this is described in his book, The Road to Elysius, a thrilling detective story on how this discovery was made, which had eluded humankind for thousands of years. Albert Hoffman has had an important effect upon consciousness research in several ways. His synthesis of LSD-25 provided humankind with an incisive tool for the investigation of perception, cognition, affect, creativity, imagery, and imagination. The difficulties that science, medicine, and society at large have had in making full use of this gift suggest that, alas, LSD was probably a premature discovery, at least in industrialized countries. In native societies, they have known for thousands of years how to use wisely these compounds. And I've seen Albert over the years on both sides of the Atlantic. One of our meetings was in the Austrian Alps. We were there for a conference of shamans. And we both gave our talks, but the real stars were the traditional healers from North America, South America, from Asia. One of them, Don Jose Rios, also known as Matsua, a Huichol shaman who at that time was 107 years of age and who was still going strong, was flown to Europe for this trip, and we were all worried about how he would take that transatlantic crossing. And at the airport, we were saying, Don Jose, Don Jose, how did you do it? How do you feel? You know, at, at your age, were you able to make that crossing? He said, well, I just took a little peyote before I got on the airplane. I'm still flying. <laughs> <laughs> well,
Well, we can learn a lot from these native practitioners. I've certainly learned a lot in my day, Albert as well. Hoffman has contributed to the development of methodological advances in consciousness research. Obviously, he is a first-rate chemist who has been awarded honorary doctorates from the University of Zurich and the Stockholm Pharmaceutical Trust. But he has also pioneered in the study of participant observation techniques, using himself as a human laboratory for the study of drug effects. In addition, he is engaged in field research, visiting remote parts of the world to observe the use of psychoactive plants in native settings. All of these research approaches are approaches that we endorse and use at Saybrook, and this is why Hoffman is such an important figure to our graduate students. Also, incidentally, a few weeks ago, some of us, including Andy Wilde, who are here in the audience, were in the Soviet Union for a conference on hidden reserves of the human psyche in Moscow. And one of the discoveries that I made was that in the 1930s and 1940s, Soviet researchers were using mescaline and other psychedelic substances for self-experimentation. Now, they didn't dare write this up because this was in the days of the Stalinist terror. But they kept journals, and now finally those journals are being, are being carefully collected and hopefully will be published. And let me tell you, this is an important piece of data that I hope we can get here for the Albert Hoffman Library, these journals from Moscow. <laughs> finally, Albert Hoffman has never hesitated to consider the ethical implications of his discoveries. He has made known his opposition to the casual use of LSD and similar substances, but he has also been open in discussing the philosophical implications of his work. He has spent time with numerous visitors discussing their LSD-induced mystical and religious experiences. He has written and lectured on such topics as appearance and reality, the connections between human and the, humans and the environment, and the presence of a creative force in all living things. In his autobiography, Albert Hoffman wrote, what is needed today is a fundamental re-experience of the openness of all living things, a comprehensive reality consciousness that will ever more infrequently develop spontaneously, the more the primordial flora and fauna of our Mother Earth must yield to a dead technological environment. That's something that my shaman friends would say, and Albert said it just as eloquently. When the history of consciousness research is fully written, the stature of Albert Hoffman will be obvious to the historians. They will write that here was a man who was a brilliant scientist and an innovative researcher, but more important, one who accepted the responsibilities accompanying his discoveries. Unlike many other scientists of the 20th century, he did not separate science from ethics. He behaved responsibly with commitment, accepting the burdens as well as the joys of his mission. Our tributes to him tonight only foreshadow the accolades that will accumulate in time from a new psychology, a new medicine, and a new science of consciousness that will freely acknowledge that they will always be in Albert Hoffman's debt. Thank you. Before I introduce this next speaker, I should say it's a great honor for me to be asked to make these uh, introductions. I am uh, definitely the new kid on the block <laughs> and quite in awe of these characters, so let me tell you. Uh, our next speaker, a figure known to many of you, I think I first became aware of him, I don't know exactly, probably it was fall of 65 or 66. There was a magazine called Ramparts, which has been defunct now for many years, but they printed an extract from The Natural Mind. And my friends and I, who were just beginning to smoke marijuana and use LSD, avidly studied the pages of this Ramparts article, for it purported to represent different drug states uh, on each page of illustration. And uh, I think the natural mind, which was later superseded by uh, chocolate to morphine, which had the, to my mind, indubitable honor 
of being banned in Florida. <laughs> These uh, publications, which I'm sure are familiar to all of you, countless publications uh, in ethnomycology, uh, a man with a great enthusiasm for the mushroom foray, the long conversation, scholar, physician, social theorist, your friend and mine, Andy Weil. Hi. It's good to be here. It's always good to be among friends. I have to do a lot of work in the course of an average year, and a lot of that is going out into the cold and not being among friends and trying to talk the message. Uh, in this past year, for example, I had to go and give a number of all-day workshops on consciousness and drug policy in the Iron Range of Minnesota uh, at a number of community colleges that keep asking me to come back and do that. Um, I had to talk to a number of audiences of psychiatrists in medical schools and hospitals giving grand rounds on such, such subjects as the nature of the placebo response. Um, it's hard. <laughs> it's nice to be among friends. Now, I... <laughs> I wish I could tell you, I wish I could join in all the uh, warmth of this occasion to tell you that the revolution in consciousness is moving right ahead and uh, that we are about to transform government and external reality as a result of that. <laughs> but, you know, it ain't so. Uh, and I say that as somebody who goes through the Iron Range of Minnesota and passes through airports and looks around me. And I have to tell you that I feel that the majority of human beings uh, that I encounter uh, operate mostly out of fear, guilt, and that when people operate from those emotions, they are dangerous to themselves and to others. We are a very small minority, a very small minority, and have no illusions about that. And whether our minority will grow fast enough and be able to influence humanity fast enough to avoid the catastrophe that is certain to come if we persist in the ways that we now persist. I don't know. And if, if we can't, if, if it may be as it appears that our ability to manipulate the environment, our technological ability, is so disparate with our ability to control our own emotions, that may be a fatal flaw of our species. It may be. If it is, that has to be all right too, because I feel and this is based on a lot of my experiences with substances that we all know and love, uh, that deep down everything is all right and it's the way it's supposed to be. And there may be a lot of drama in between, but it's all all right. <laughs> I upset people a lot when I say, but this is true, that I am not a human chauvinist. Uh, if our species destroys itself, which is a possibility, um, I don't think there's any way that we can destroy life, by the way, or the life process, or consciousness, which I think preceded life and preceded the human organism and the human brain. Uh, you know, if that happens, it's okay with me if something else gets a chance. If, <laughs> if the life force experiments with another form, that's fine. That's okay too. I mean, I hope that doesn't happen. I will work to try to keep it from happening, but either way, it's all right. Now, if there's any hope of keeping that from happening, it has to involve basic change at the level of consciousness. And particularly, it has to involve basic change in the nature of science and technology, which has become the religion of our society. Medicine, which is an arm of that, really, I think, has taken the function of religion in traditional societies, and physicians fulfill the roles, although not very well, that priests have in traditional societies. And when people in traditional when something happens that's never happened before in a traditional society, you go to the shaman for an interpretation of whether it's good or evil. In our society, we go to doctors, and we ask whether it's good or bad for our health. Now, that is our modern version of all this. But medicine and science do not fulfill this magical religious role well. There has to be a change in that area. 
And some of what I'd like to say to you tonight is about the nature of science, the problem of studying consciousness, and some of the lessons that I have learned from having the privilege of knowing Albert Hofmann and having seen him, although infrequently, at gatherings of this sort. The pro there are some inherent problems in studying consciousness, and they should not be belittled, because you can't make them go away. The first is that consciousness is not material. Our science is materialistic. How do you study, by methods looking at the material world, something which is fundamentally not material? This is why research on hypnosis is so awful. It's why hypnosis, for however many years it's been around, remains something that has an unsavory scent about it to scientists and medical doctors. Why it has always had an uneasy relationship to medical science. And even though the effects are dramatic and obvious, I once saw a woman have a, a baby by cesarean section under hypnosis anesthesia. She was fully conscious and was asked to look up and watch when the baby was delivered and so forth. And what more could you ask of in the way of a dramatic uh, example of how consciousness can change physical reactions? And yet despite this, research in this area is just awful. The reason is simply that when someone is in hypnosis, there is no objective way that you can document that fact. There is no objective reproducible change in the physical sphere that is a marker of that altered state of consciousness. And if your science is totally materialistic, how can you make sense of that? And if you can't make sense of things as a scientist, what are you going to do about that? The first thing you can do is try to ignore it because it's a threat to your worldview if there's something out there that you can't explain. And if people won't let you ignore it, then you can make fun of it or belittle it or treat it as if it's a joke or something irrelevant. And if you can't do that and somebody continues to force you to look at it, you can get mad at the person and punch them out. <laughs> and you see all these range of responses in this field of consciousness research. And the second problem is that consciousness is rooted in experience. And here, it seems to me, is the fundamental absurdity of the way that our science has developed. The most obvious fact of our existence is that we are conscious. That is the most obvious, most important aspect of our existence. How can you construct a worldview? How can you construct a system that tries to explain the universe and leave that out? And yet that is what our science tries to do. It tries to act as if consciousness doesn't exist and to construct mechanistic explanations of phenomena without reference to that. And that gets us in a lot of trouble. It leads us to come up with some very implausible mechanisms and explanations for phenomena. And it also leaves us unable to explain a lot of things out there, like hypnosis, that may be very important to us. Now, I am particularly conscious of this because I work as a physician. I practice general medicine. And I practice medicine based on the assumption that consciousness is central to any theory of health and healing and illness. And that when anybody comes to me, whether they're well or sick, I am always paying attention to their state of consciousness as well as to their state of the body. And often I find in my experience that changes in the realm of consciousness along must accompany physical treatments if the physical treatments are to work. That is my experience, and I go by my experience. I see all the time, one of the saddest things that I see in my practice is vast numbers of people who come to me who have been inadvertently hexed by their encounters with medical doctors. You know, there's a very well-known phenomenon of hexing that has been described by anthropologists and, and psychologists. There's a little bit of medical literature on this as well. There was a, an article in the AMA Journal in this past year reported without comment of a woman in Cal here in Southern California who had an advanced case of lupus, systemic lupus, a major and serious autoimmune disease. She was examined at a university hospital here, put on massive doses of steroids and immunosuppressive drugs, did not respond. She was Filipino. And after a period of time, she told her doctor that she was certain that the disease was the result of a curse that had been placed on her by a witch doctor in the Philippines, and that she could not be helped unless she went back there and had that lifted. So she went back there and had a good witch doctor lift the curse, and she came back cured. 
She was off all medication at that point. And this was reported in the AMA journal without comment as an example of hexing in medicine. <laughs> so they can see that kind of thing, but don't know what to make of it. But what I see is the creation of disease by doctors or the perpetuation of disease by doctors. Sometimes, and this is done with verbal magic. If I were king, I would require in medical schools a course in the power of words and the importance in being very... <laughs> the importance of being extremely careful about the words you choose in speaking to a sick patient and a patient who has come to you. Most medical doctors have no sense of their power as priests. They have no sense of their power to create expectation in somebody who comes to them in that role. And they abuse that all the time. Occasionally this happens consciously. Sometimes I see cases where doctors dislike patients and say nasty things to them in anger, but that's quite rare. Much more often, these things are said unconsciously and unthinkingly. A doctor makes some idle remark, and years later, this remark burns like a red-hot coal in that person's memory and is a principal obstacle to healing or any change in their physical condition. Let me give you a very gross example. A patient came to me this past year from Finland, a woman from Helsinki, who was in her mid-30s and had had multiple sclerosis for the past five years. She was on large doses of toxic drugs, steroids and immunosuppressive drugs, which she did not need and were doing her only harm. She was very depressed. The thing that most alarmed me about her was that her emotional reaction to her illness was completely wooden. She talked about it as if it were happening to someone else. I thought that was a very alarming state of consciousness to be in about having a devastating disease. I worked with her over the period of a month and got her connected up with, I put her on a good diet and I gave her some herbal medicines to take and I got her connected up with a visualization therapist and with some good uh, exercise physiology people and a lot of people who had very positive attitudes and over the space of a month she changed completely. She became a happy person who was able to laugh and for the first time she saw the possibility that she could affect the course of this disease. That she was not simply a passive victim of some outside force operating with her. And the day before she was to go back to Finland, we were sitting together and she was laughing and joking and she said to me, you know, you wouldn't believe what those doctors did to me in Helsinki. She said that the neurologist at this hospital, that it had taken a while to make the diagnosis, her main symptom was dizzy spells, and there had been endless testing and finally they had made the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. And when they did, the chief neurologist called her into his office and told her she had this disease. And then he said, wait here a minute, and he went out and brought in a wheelchair and told, asked her to sit in the wheelchair and said that he suggested that she sit in a wheelchair for one to two hours a day to practice. <laughs> wheelchair practice. I say that's a gross example, but I see many many, many examples of this kind of thing. And it comes from ignorance. It comes from not seeing the importance of, of states of consciousness, of the non-physical realm of medicine and treatment and interaction with people, of thinking that everything is material. And I must also tell you that in my time in medicine, I got my medical degree in 1968, 20 years, this has gotten worse, not better. For example, when I was in the medical school, Ulcerative colitis was considered one of the classic four psychosomatic diseases. One of the four diseases that all doctors recognized had a mental emotional component. Medical students today are not taught that. They're now taught all about elaborate mechanisms in the colon and interactions with bacteria and biochemical things in the colon. And I presented them a case, the way I discovered this, I had a fascinating case of a man who was a heavy smoker in good health in his 50s who quit smoking and three months later, out of the blue, developed the symptoms of ulcerative colitis. He was, went to a chief of gastroenterology at the university hospital, was put on a lot of drugs that did him no good. They did not tell him not to drink coffee. He was drinking three cups of coffee in the morning, which is poison for anyone with colitis. After several months of getting in worse and worse relations with the gastroenterologist, he had an intuition that if he started smoking again, his colitis would go away. So he did, and it did, very rapidly. And when he came to see me, he had been through this cycle two more times, with the same results, except that each time, the colitis had appeared faster after he stopped smoking and it took longer to go away after he started. And when I saw him, he was terrified that he was going to wind up both being an addicted smoker and have ulcerative colitis. 
<laughs> this year, at the beginning, or at the beginning of last, in, in the middle of last year, an article appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine reporting an increased incidence of ulcerative colitis in ex-smokers, not in current smokers. And the article went through all this biochemistry about nicotine and so forth, and the conclusion was we can think of no possible mechanism by which cessation of smoking could result in an increased incidence of ulcerative colitis. I mean, how dense do you have to be to see that mechanism? Smoking literally burns up nervous energy. That's one reason why people get sucked into it. And if you shut that door, that energy is going to go somewhere. Why in one person it goes down and causes this problem in the colon, and why in another person it may do something else, I don't know. And I have no problem saying I don't know about things either. <laughs> The reason that's not, anyway, I presented this case to a group of second year medical students at the University of Arizona. They had not been taught that ulcerative colitis was a psychosomatic disease. They had not heard that. The most important single fact about ulcerative colitis, because that's the sphere through which you can influence it most, not mentioned. So in 20 years, I don't see progress. I see things going in the other direction. Now, one of the most obnoxious traits of modern science is its tendency to negate our experience. I mean, there is nothing more obnoxious than to tell a scientist that you have experienced something, and the science tells, tells you that no, you haven't, because he can demonstrate objectively that that didn't happen. And science does this all the time. Science does it very frequently in the area of psychoactive drug research. There are an awful lot of researchers who have never taken a psychoactive drug and are studying things like marijuana or LSD and have not tried it themselves. How can you, how can you, how can you do that? <laughs> there was a period when I, there was a period when I get, got asked a lot to testify as an expert witness in, in uh, various drug cases. And uh, when these would go to juries, you know, in front of judges, the prosecutors are usually reasonably well behaved. But when you get in front of a jury, it's no holds barred. And so they start right in with, well, Dr. Weil, have you ever taken this drug yourself? And uh, I did this recently with uh, in a peyote case in Arizona, in a Mormon area of Arizona, which didn't look great. And uh, the chief of pharmacology, who is a hardcore scientific materialist at my medical school, and we don't get along very well, we nod to each other in the hall, but we think very differently, uh, was the chief witness for the prosecution. He tested about, talked about giving mescaline to cats, grinding up their brains, and looking at degenerative changes. I said what I knew about peyote, and the prosecutor, a woman, then lit into me and started with, uh, you know, well, Dr. Wild, have you ever taken peyote? And I said, of course I had taken peyote, but I wouldn't consider myself an expert on peyote if, in addition to whatever else I did, I hadn't taken it myself. And she said, oh, and, uh, <laughs> and what other, have you taken this and have you taken that? And I said, look, I can save you time. I have taken every drug I have ever written about. <laughs> and I wouldn't do it otherwise. She said, well, have you gotten legal permission to do this? I said, well, I, I don't know who you apply to for a permit to take nutmeg, for example. <laughs> anyway, the jury acquitted the man. They said this was an unwarranted invasion of freedom of religion by the state of Arizona. Great. Good. And when talked to afterwards by lawyers, they said a major reason was the contrast between this pharmacologist who testified at great length and talked down to them and made them feel as if they didn't know anything and couldn't understand science, and somebody who talked from their own experience. Now, this is a real problem because science and its products today are very toxic in our world. A lot of the problem that we have is the way that science and technology are going. Albert Hofmann has, is to me a model for what science can be. He has operated from intuition. He has operated from his own experience. He is a good scientist. He combines the best of experience, of intuition, and intellect. That to me is the model for what science should be. And he's come up with very good things. And I want to make one other comment about him that I find another area in which I am very impressed by him. And this I say as a medical doctor. He ages terrifically well. <laughs> 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 
when I first met him years ago, uh, he presented himself as a very formal Swiss chemist, but I noticed that he twinkled. <laughs> and I still see that twinkle about him. And his, the, his presence is much younger than his chronological age. That to me is very interesting. I have a lot of old people in my medical practice, a lot of people in their 70s and 80s. And a lot of people ask me, what is the secret of growing old well? Well, the materialistic scientist says it's to choose your parents right. <laughs> you know, that it's all genes. Well, I don't believe that because that's not my prejudice. I look at the other side of things. And I think that mental state and mental, mental attitude are the key to that. And there is something to me that I connect that fact of twinkling and youthfulness not equivalent to chronological age. So I think in both of those areas, he is a teacher for me and an inspiration for all of us. And I'm delighted to have been asked here to talk about him. Thank you. Andy will be a tough act to follow, but we have just the man. <laughs> but before I introduce him, I, I, some of you may wonder why Laura Huxley is uh, not here tonight. Uh, she had uh, a crisis in her family that arose rather close to this date, and uh, so she was unable to be here tonight. It's a great pity because she was to represent femininity and the goddess, which is certainly a central concern for anyone. who is sensitive to the psychedelic issue. In fact, one way of looking at what psychedelics do is they simply dissolve the male ego and uh, allow a more natural constellation of the psyche to show through. And speaking of natural, I now want to introduce uh, a man who it was always my great fear I might someday have to introduce. <laughs> a man who is a legend in his own right, a man who speaks across the species line to the denizens of the deep sea, and across the stellar barrier to the denizens of distant stars, like myself, an altar boy in his youth, <laughs> a man who has given new meaning to the concept enfant terrible. <laughs> we can say of him, they threw the mold away before they made him. <laughs> No, I love to tease him. I love to watch him. The Obi-Wan Kenobi of psychedelic research, John C. Lilly. Thomas Bobistum. <laughs> Ite Misa S. Go, the mass is over. <laughs> My psychedelic experience has started about age seven, when I had visions of God on his throne, angel choir, and so on. And I told a nun about this in the Catholic school I was attending. And she said, Oh, but only saints have visions. <laughs> and she abolished me being a saint, which was a good idea. <laughs> it wasn't until about 1953, when I was at the National Institute of Mental Health, and the LSD pushers got after me, that I heard about LSD. So I read all the literature, and I invented the isolation tank in 1954, and I was floating around the tank. People wanted me to take LSD and experience what that was like in the tank. I said, no, I have to get a physiological baseline, being a proper scientist. 
a physiological baseline on me as an observer. So I floated around for 10 years. <laughs> in spite of the pushers on both coasts. And in 1964, I finally decided, well, it's time to take it. So I came to California, had two trips, and then got Sidney Cohen to give me some. And I went to St. Thomas and Virgin Islands and floated in a isolation tank there. It was an eight-foot cube of seawater. I was scared stiff, absolutely terrified. And I took, injected 300 micrograms of Dr. Hoffman's elixir <laughs> intramuscularly and floated in the tank. And suddenly I was precipitated out to the farthest reaches of all the universes that exist. Well, I didn't, I didn't remain human at all. I stayed out there for about six hours, and then I was squeezed back into the body that was lying in the tank, and I cried. I couldn't stand it. Why should this happen? Why become so limited as being human? Well, since then, I've spent many years trying to be human. And uh, some women think I'm successful. <laughs> Others do not. And I'm still trying, at age 73, to get my feet on the ground and my torso in the bed. <laughs> it's fun, and uh, all I can say is that anybody that uses the word drug, drugs, ought to have their heart and their soul examined. There is no such thing as drugs. There's no such thing as illegal drugs. They're only chemicals. They can change the molecular configuration within the brain itself and hence change who you are and where you're going and where you come from. This is a profound experience. I've written up as much of it as I can in books, but I've written only as much as could be published. Please speak louder. We can't turn the mic up any higher. So. <laughs> the boss. <laughs> well, the, uh, the DEA ought to know about this meeting tonight, and Ron Joel ought to put you in jail. Because <laughs> our drug enforcement agency is staffed by lawyers and ex-judges and so on, and I don't think they know what the score is. Somebody said on TV the other day, uh, the drug problem ought to be turned over to the Surgeon General and taken away from the Attorney General. I think that the laws ought to be changed in the light of new, new knowledge, of new views, such as all of you have experienced, and we ought to pressure these people to get educated in what it is to take LSD, what it is to take cocaine, and so on. None of these substances have been treated as the way a proper researcher would treat them, working on himself. I was brought up by a student of J.B.S. Holden, who laid down to his students that if you're going to do experiments on any human subject, you must be your first subject. So I went through various things, like explosive decompression and so on, uh, and I started my LSD work alone, and I continued my work with ketamine alone. The isolation tank is a marvelous place for the scientific observer to look at the chaos within himself and not attribute it to something else. However, I wish to point out also that I've experienced intelligence that's far greater than mine or any human, and I call them the Earth Coincidence Control Office, ECHO, E-C-C-O. They're very profound, and they're monkeying around with everybody, and me especially, and taught me many, many things, whether I liked it or not. For example, I, when I take ketamine, or have taken ketamine in the past, they take charts. And I went to the UCLA Medical Library and read up on the psychotherapeutic use of ketamine, a uh, psychedelic anesthetic. And there's a uranium paper, uranium, uranium paper, in which they treated 100 subjects in the hospital, and they all got out of the hospital with one treatment. 
Uh, they use what was called anxiety provocation. It would give the person the ketamine and then scare them to death. <laughs> and of course, they abandoned their uh, neurosis, their psychosis, or whatever. <laughs> well, I read that one afternoon, came home, and lay down on a mattress in my living room, and took 200 milligrams of ketamine. This is fairly large dose. And Suddenly, the Earth Coincidence Control Office precipitated me into the year 3000 and they removed my penis by bloodless methods and handed it to me. So I screamed in terror and my wife Tony came in from our bedroom and said, oh, it's still a task. Look. So I looked up at the ceiling and I said, who's in charge up there? A bunch of psychotic kids? The answer came back, no, you were over at UCLA there reading about anxiety provocation in order to cure one of the unconscious conflicts. That was your unconscious conflict, and we brought it out for you. <laughs> well, I don't know why this isn't being used in psychotherapy the way LSD has been. Uh, I suspect it's because psychotherapists don't like to be scared to death. I don't like to see people being very badly frightened. And they also don't like to see them get well because then they lose their income. <laughs> I learned long ago that one is the psychotherapist until one is cured of one's own diseases. <laughs> I'm still not cured. <laughs> well, I must say, I want to tell you a story that I told this afternoon about me and Albert Hoffman. I first met him in 1977 at the uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. He gave a night lecture, and the students cheered everything he said, including when he said, I'm not a guru, I'm a Swiss chemist. <laughs> After his talk, he, they had a uh, reception, and with my knees shaking and sweat breaking out of my brow, I walked through the line and reached out and to shake his hand, and I said, I'm John Lilly. He, he grabbed my hand with both of his, and he said, You are? I just finished ten of the cyclone. And our experiences were very parallel. And I thought to myself, God bless it, I wish you had written that up in 1943, and we said it was a lot of trouble. We know that if you've been doing your homework, then on average, this group has slightly weaker kidneys than the normal American population. <laughs> so um, we are going to call a 20-minute intermission, and then we'll have a, a musical interlude, and then Dr. Hoffman's keynote address for the evening. Will the volunteers who are helping with the event, please come up to the stage and we'll meet back here, everybody, in 20 minutes. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Terrence McKenna again, who's going to encourage you to donate freely to our foundation. <laughs> so, uh, here's Terrence. <laughs> and thank you all very much for being here tonight. Oscar, excuse me, I want to introduce very briefly Oscar Janiger. I got out of order here. And I'd like you all to give him a very, very warm welcome. He's got a guiding spirit in our efforts to make this foundation a reality. Oscar. Thank you very much. I, I've been practicing the last uh, hour to twinkle. <laughs> Since I heard Andy Wilde, I, I, I don't know how successful I am, but maybe you and Trump Rose will let me know later. Uh, 
This is the culmination of a long journey for me, which began in April of 1954, when I first had my encounter, as many of you have, with these extraordinary medicines. And I did uh, many years of research, about 10 years, and then, as we put it, the troubles began. Not the troubles for everybody, but for some of the researchers. So we could not simply continue with the work that we did before. Uh, those following years are too well known to bear any repetition for those of you who lived uh, through it. And uh, what we have now is a memory uh, in the general public of all of the evils and the problems of these drugs that accrued from its use uh, at that time, illegal use of LSD. Uh, really, very little is known about the work that was done prior to that time by a lot of very serious people who were working very hard to understand this, this simply extraordinary substance. And we would like to be able to bring that forth and to let people know and pierce the obfuscations and the fogs of what happened in the latter years and begin to see what the basis for further research uh, research on LSD might, might really entail. And in order to do that, we have to collect all that material and put it together and codify it and make it available to the public and to researchers and investigators. And also, by the way, the future historians who I would like to believe will find this a remarkable watershed time in the history of the study of consciousness. So in order to do this, uh, we've uh, gotten a number of people together and quite remarkably so because in a movement, this, uh, uh, this potent, this cultural movement that was so stirring, we still have a good number of the people who were uh, the, part of your original group. That's quite unusual in, in this impression of cultural time. And so what we would like to do is collect all this, have it available, and really give people some understanding and some insight and education into the use of these materials. And to me, that would be uh, the greatest effort that we can make to legitimately bring this back and to use it the proper way, as we would all like to do. In order to do that, we sincerely need your help, and your response to tonight indicates that there is a good deal of enthusiasm and interest in doing this. But remember, we have to have the education, we have to have people know what this drug has done and how we have looked at it and, and the care we've given to try to understand it. And also, I might add that probably the street laboratory was not an entire chaos is probably a good amount of data that could be collected on personal accounts and things that happened over those years. We'd like to bring those in and also review those as well. Keep in mind that when we talk of consciousness and however you want to interpret that, the organization will also look at all the other methods. We're not focused on LSD alone. LSD was a tool that had to be placed in our hands fortuitously at this time. So we want to use that, uh, the organization as an umbrella for all of these things that are going on and give a further emphasis to these studies. We need your help, and Terrence is going to tell you how we're going to get it. Thank you very much. Well, I think you can probably tell for yourselves when you listen to Os Janiger talk that you're listening to a man discuss his dream. Os mentioned to me several years ago that he had the notion for an archive of psychedelic material and took me on a tour of his house to look at the filing cabinets, the packing boxes filled with his own immense collection of material relating to creativity and LSD. And as we surveyed his 
library, we talked of the many other libraries that researchers like Wasson and Hoffman have gathered together over the years. This is a priceless informational research uh, repository. One of the largest libraries devoted to this kind of material is the Fitzhugh Ludlow Library, which currently is in storage in a used store in Santa Rosa. Now this is no place for these kind of collections to languish. They should be available to the new generation of graduate students, historians, social commentators, who will rescue psychedelics from the opprobrium that was heaped upon them by a hysterical government in a hysterical era now thankfully, let us hope, behind us. Os is an extremely modest man, always willing to let somebody else stand in the spotlight. Well, you know, it's an old saying that the way to get things done is to not care about who gets the credit. So tonight when I was urging him to stand before you, I said, Os, you just have to let the people of this town have an opportunity to show you how much they love you. Well, an Irishman giving advice to a Jewish psychotherapist uh, doesn't get very far, but I want to join with you in saluting Oscar Yanniker, a, a pioneer and a giant. We have to move along here, it's a school night for some of us. Uh, I have a couple of announcements uh, tonight's program uh, will be heard uh, tomorrow night at midnight on the most intellectually far-reaching and deep voice in the media, Roy of Hollywood show, What's Happening on KPFK. Roy and Diane are here tonight. There they are. Another example of modest, self-effacing people who know how to get things done and who have an enormous impact on what gets thought in this town. Uh, I've also been asked to say that those of you who are suffering with the heat, the air conditioning has failed, it isn't your imagination, <laughs> and uh, for that we apologize. It must be something about Switzerland. I don't know how many of you know who Brother Klaus is, probably not more than a half a dozen. Carl Jung wrote about the visions of Brother Klaus. Carl Jung was another Swisser with a deep love of country. Paracelsus, the great 16th century alchemist, was born in Switzerland. So this tiny country with a tradition of human freedom and a tradition of deep involvement with spiritual transformation has given us in the 20th century, in the late 20th century, the heir to Carl Jung, the heir to Paracelsus, the heir to Brother Klaus, Albert Hoffman, alchemist, philosopher, chemist, human being, a man of whom it might be said, as was said of Giordano Bruno and Galileo in the 16th century, they brought astronomy of age. What the telescope was to astronomy in the 16th century, the psychedelic compounds that Dr. Hoffman has discovered could be, should be, to 20th century psychology. Psychology without psychedelics is pissing into the wind. <laughs> and I think we've had quite enough of it. It's time for a deep, serious revisioning 
of what notions like human potential, consciousness expansion, contact with the world soul, time for a deep revisioning of what these concepts can mean for us. You know, it was the great French sociologist Jacques Ellul who said, there are no political solutions, only technological ones. The rest is propaganda. And if you include in the definition of technology a revivifying of the ancient technology of shamanic ecstasy through the use of psychedelic compounds, then I think you will have to agree, and Andy hinted at this, we are not going to save the monkey unless we can shed the monkey. And the greatest impetus, the greatest inspiration to the expression of our higher selves comes in the confrontation with psyche that occurs in the psychedelic experience. Ladies and gentlemen, meet the man who made the 20th century that we all know can be a model for all future time. Here from Basel, Switzerland, Dr. Albert Hoffman, the father of psilocybin and LSD. the warm reception which I received here in California. I thank you so much. I am sorry I must apologize that I must rely in my talk on my paper, speak in a foreign language. The announced topic of this meeting embarrasses me to some extent. First, because it puts me too much in the center of the event, the inauguration of a library dedicated to preserve and make available the legacy of consciousness research of the last 50 years. To this research, I made only a substantial contribution substance in the true sense of this verb, namely in the form of two substances, <laughs> which became influential. Second, I am embarrassed because you may expect from me a survey uh, of 50 years of research in consciousness. But this research is a domain of psychologists, psychiatrists, and philosophers. Being a chemist, I am not competent to present such a survey. What I can tell you are only my personal experiences and ideas. Precisely 50 years ago, in 1938, I synthesized a substance which had an, at that time, unexpected influence on my life and which led to influence and changed the life of many others. I mean, the lysergic acid, the IPLMI, known as LSD 25 or just LSD. Its preparation and the discovery of its astonishing effects on the psyche have been described and published already so many times that they need not be repeated here. And in addition, you, uh, Dr. Strickner has presented to you the whole story this evening. I am often asked what has made the deepest impression upon me in my LSD experiments, and whether I have arrived at new understandings 
through these experiences. Of greatest significance to me has been the insight that I attained as a fundamental understanding from all my LSD experiences that what one commonly takes as the reality by no means signifies something fixed, but rather something that is ambiguous. That there is not only one, but there are many real realities, each compromising a different consciousness of the auto of the ego. One can arrive at this insight through scientific reflection. The problem of reality is and has been from time immemorial a central concern of philosophy. There is, however, a fundamental distinction whether one approaches the problem of reality rationally or if one obtrudes upon this problem emotionally through an existential experience. The first plan then is the experience was therefore so deeply moving and alarming because everyday reality which had until then been considered to be the only one reality dissolved and an unfamiliar ego experienced another unfamiliar reality. Another problem also appeared. That concerning the innermost self which itself unmoved was able to record these external and internal transformations. How could so strange changes in the experience of reality be explained? Evidently, the outer, objective, material world did not change during the time I was under the influence of LSD. Therefore, something inside me, in the experiencing subject, must have been altered. These reflections led me to conceive reality as the product of a transmitter, the material exterior, exterior world, and the receiver, our consciousness, the inner spiritual center of a human individual. In order to describe the mechanism by which reality comes into being through the interaction of these two factors, transmitter and receiver, one can use the metaphor of TV broadcasting. Evidently, both transmitter and receiver are needed to produce a TV picture. If either of one is lacking, the TV screen will remain blank and there will be no sound. Correspondingly, if only the material world existed without conscious humans, or vice versa, no human reality would exist. Let us now examine what we know about what comprises human reality, still using the transmitter-receiver metaphor. First, what is the fundamental difference between transmitter and receiver? Whereas there is only one transmitter, one outer material world, there are as many receivers as there are human beings. And whereas the outer material world exists objectively, human consciousness is a subjective spiritual entity. All that we know objectively about the exterior world, about the transmitter, has been revealed by a scientific research. All that can be discerned objectively 
in the exterior world is matter and energy. Matter occurring in innumerable inorganic forms, the stars, the earth, with its oceans and mountains, with its, with its organisms of the plant and animal kingdoms, with the, with the products of human creativity, cities, objects of our daily life and of arts, we are surrounded with matter and are matter ourselves with our body existence. The science which is involved with investigation of matter is chemistry. The other component of the outer world which can be objectified is energy. Energy occurring as radiation, heat and kinetic energy. So much for the transmitter. Now, what do we know about the receiver? About human consciousness? Consciousness defies scientific definition. For it is what I need to contemplate what consciousness is. Our inability to grasp the very nature of consciousness can be illustrated by this metaphor. You can pull yourself into the air by taking on your own head. All attempts to define consciousness are pathological. Consciousness can only be described as the receptive and creative spiritual center of the ego, as the very core of what we call I. Consciousness remains a mystery the very central mystery of our existence. This becomes even more evident if we examine its role as receiver in the production of reality. The antennae of the human receiver are formed by our five sensory organs. The antenna for optical images, the eye, is capable of receiving electromagnetic waves and projecting a picture onto the retina that coincides with the object from which those waves emanate. It is important to realize that the human eye can only receive a very small band of the immeasurable spectrum of electromagnetic waves traveling through the universe, namely only waves measuring 0.4 to 0.7 thousand millimeters. Within this small section, our eyes and the receiver and consciousness are capable of differentiating between different wavelengths and recording them as different colors. In connection with our reflections on reality, it is important to note that colors do not exist in the exterior world. Most, most of are not aware of this basic fact. Even so, it can be looked up in every textbook on physiology. All that actually object, objectively exists in the outer world is matter, matter transmitting energy, transmitting electromagnetic oscillations of varying wavelengths. If an object reflects or transmits electromagnetic waves, with a length of 0.4 thousandths of a millimeter, same with the that it is blue. If it transmits waves with a length of 0.7, 
thousands of women we describe to objects as being red. This means that the perception of color is a purely psychological and subjective event taking place in the inner space of an individual. The brightly colored world, as we see it, does not exist on the outside. It exists only on the screen inside every individual uh, of every individual. Regarding the acoustic world, there is a similar relationship between transmitter and receiver. The antenna for acoustic signals, the ear displays a similar limited breadth of reception in its function as part of the receiver. Unlike colors, sounds do not exist object objectively. What does exist objectively are, once again, waves, wave-like compressions and expansions of the air, which are received by the ear, registered by the tympanic membrane, and transformed into the sensation of sound in the hearing center of the brain. All the other aspects of reality which are made accessible by the remaining three senses, souls of taste, smell and touch, are created by the interaction of transmitters in the outer world and receivers in the inner world. Just like sound and colors, touch, smell and taste don't exist objectively. They too represent purely subjective phenomena, occurring only in the inner space of individual humans. The metaphor of reality as the product of transmitter and the receiver clearly illustrates that the seemingly objective picture of the world surrounding us that which we call reality is actually a subjective picture. This basic fact signifies that the screen is not outside but inside of every human being. We all carry inside our own personal image of reality created by our own private receiver. Understanding reality as a product of transmitter and receiver takes on an especially important meaning which could existentially alter our daily life when we consider the part that each receiver, each individual human plays in the role of is the formation of reality. We become fully aware of the world creating power present in every human being. Our understanding makes us aware of the fact that each individual is the creator of his or her own world. For it is in each individual mind and only there that the world and the abundance of life it contains, that the stars and the sky become real, become human reality, uh, become human reality. Our real, true freedom and responsibility is formed in our ability to create our own individual world. Once I have recognized what part of reality is objectively on the outside and what is subjectively taking place within myself, then I am more aware of what I can change in my life. Where I have a choice, 
And thus, what I am responsible for, conversely, I become aware what is beyond my willpower and has to be accepted as an unalterable fact. This clarification of my potential and my responsibility can be of invaluable help. I have the ability to choose what I want to receive from the endless infinite program of the great transmitter from creation. That means that I can let those aspects of creation of the cosmos that make me happy enter into my consciousness and thus infuse them with reality. Or I can let in other aspects, those that depress me. It is I who creates the bright and the dark picture of the world. It is I who invests the objects that are only shaped matter in the outer world, not only with their color, but with my affection and my love, also with their meaning. This applies not only to my inanimate surroundings, but also to the living beings, to the plants, the animals, and to my fellow humans. With this insight, the full creative power of life becomes evident. Just as I am the receiver for messages from my fellow man, I am in turn a transmitter for him. Since I am materially located in his outer world, I can only convey my messages, my desires, even if they are purely spiritual, an idea or my love only through that what characterizes the transmitter, namely via matter and energy. Understanding expressed by a glance or a light touch, even this can only be conveyed by material things, material eyes, by the material bodies of a living power. This shows that communication would not be possible without matter and energy. The transmit-receiver metaphor for reality reveals another basic fact, the fact that reality is not a fixed state, rather it is the result of a continuous input of material and energetic signals from the outer world and their continuous decoding and transformation into, in, into inner conscious experience, into inner conscious experience. This demonstrates that reality is a dynamic process being created anew at each moment. Actual reality exists in the here and now, in the moment. This explains why a child living in the hidden moment much more extensively than an adult perceives a real image of the world. It lives in a world permeated with more reality, more truth than that of the adult. To experience true reality in the moment is one of the main concerns of mysticism. That is where childlike and mystical experience meet. If reality were not the result of continuous changes but a stationary condition, there would not be no experience of the moment there would not be even any time. Since the sensation of time is only possible through the perception of change, the dynamic character of reality creates time. The transmitter-receiver concept of reality also imparts an insight into the essence of time. 
His metaphor of reality would appear to correspond to a dualistic concept of the world. External space, internal space, objective and the subjective receiver. But reality, everyday reality, can be experienced and imagined only as a totality of transmitter and receiver. There would be no picture or sound on the TV screen if either one were missing. This example makes it evident that transmitter and receiver are nothing other than constructs of our intellect. Useful, valuable, even necessary means for a rational understanding of the mechanisms by which human reality exists. Dualism is but a construct of our intelligence, which leads us to believe that the so-called objective exterior world stands in opposition to our inner subjective spiritual world. The failure to grasp that there is no dualism is one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, for the tragic, catastrophic developments in our world. This dualistic worldview, so dominant in Western culture today, has its roots in Greek pre Socratic philosophy. And in the Judeo Christian belief, makes us your servant. The experience of the world as matter, as an object to which man stands opposed, provided the philosophical basis for the development of modern natural sciences and technology. With this science and technology, man has changed the world, has subdued nature, its wealth has been exploited in a manner that may be characterized as plundering, and the sublime accomplishment of technological civilization, the comfort of Western industrial society, stands face to face with the catastrophic destruction of the environment. Our objective intellect has progressed even to the heart of the matter to the nucleus of the atom and its splitting, and has unleashed energies that threaten all life on our planet. This misuse of this knowledge could not have emerged from a consciousness of reality in which human beings perceive themselves as an integral part of living nature and the universe. All of today's attempt to make amends for the damage by adopting environmentally protective measures will remain futile or superficial patchwork if no change of the dualistic world view ensues until it is replaced by an existential experience of a deeper reality. The experience of such uh, all-encompassing reality is impeded in an environment rendered dead by human hands, such as we find in our great cities and industrial districts. Here the contrast between self and outer world becomes especially evident. It is these sensations that impress themselves, that impress themselves on everyday consciousness in Western industrial society and everywhere where technological civilization extends. It is also these morbid sensations that strongly influence modern art and literature. In a natural environment, there is less danger that split, that a split reality experience will arise. In field and forest, 
And he's the animal that our shelter therein. Indeed, in every garden, a reality is perceptible that is infinitely more real, older, deeper, and more wondrous than everything made by man. A reality that will endure long after the inanimate, mechanical, and concrete world has vanished become rested and fallen into ruin. In the sprouting, growth, blooming, fruiting, death and, re death and regeneration of plants, in their relationship with the sun, whose light they are able to convert into chemically bound energy in the form of organic compounds, out of which all that lives on our earth is built, in the being of plants, the mysterious, inexpressible, eternal life energy is evident, the same that has brought us forth and takes us back into its womb and in which we are sheltered and united with all living things. We are not leading to a sentimental enthusiasm for nature, to put to a nature in Jack Russo's sense. That romantic uh, movement which sought the idyllic in nature, which can also be understood uh, as a reaction to human's kind feeling of separation from nature. What is needed today is the fundamental existential experience of the oneness of all living things, of an all-encompassing reality. But, But this happens less and less as the primordial flora and fauna of Mother Earth must yield to a dead technological environment. The experience of reality as the ego opposed to the outer world had already begun to form itself during Greek antiquity, as I mentioned before. No doubt, at that time, people already knew the suffering connected with the dualistic consciousness of reality. The great genius tried to cure this disease by supplementing the objective Apollonian worldview with the Dionysian world of experience, in which the split was abolished in ecstatic inebriation. It is remarkable what the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche wrote about this in his book, The Geburt der Tragödie, The Birth of Tragedy. We can read that. It is either through the influence of narcotic potions of which all primitive peoples and races speak in hymns, or through the powerful approach of spring penetrating, destroying all of nature, that those Dionysian stirrings arise, which in their intensification leads the individual to forget himself completely. Not only does the bond between man and man become to be forged once again by the magic of the Dionysian rite, but alienated, hostile, and subjugated nature again celebrates her reconciliation with her prodigal son, this man. So far, Nietzsche. The Dionysian cult was closely connected with the, with the mysteries of Eleusis. The most important mysteries of the antique world, which were celebrated annually in the fall over a span of about 2,000 years. 
These victories were established by the goddess of agriculture and grain, Demeter, as thanks for the recovery of her daughter Persephone, whom Hades, the god of the underworld, had abducted. A first offering of thanks was the ear of grain, which was presented to Trichotolemus, Trichotolemus, <laughs> the first high priest of Eleusis. The cultivation of grain was then disseminated of the whole world. Persephone, however, was not allowed to, to always remain with her mother. She had to return for a part of the year to the underworld. During this time it was winter on earth. The plants died and withdrew into the ground, only to awaken to new life early in the year with Persephone's journey back to earth. The myth of Demeter, Persephone and Hades form, however, only the external framework for the events at the Mysteries. The climax of the ceremonies, began, which began with the procession from Athens to Eleusis, lasting several days, was a concluding ceremony of initiation. The initiates were forbidden by penalty of death to divulge what they had learned and beheld his innermost holy chamber of the temple, the Terestirium. Not one of the multitude that were initiated ever divulged. Parthenius, Plato, Roman emperors like Hadrian, Marcus Aurelius, and many others known figures of antiquity were part to this initiation. It must have been an illumination, a visionary glimpse of a deeper reality, an insight into the true basis of the universe. We can deduce this from the initiates' own statements about the value and the importance of the vision. For example, it is reported in a Homeric hymn, Bliss is among men on earth who has beheld that. He who has not been initiated into the holy mysteries remains a corpse in gloomy darkness. Pindar speaks of the Eleusian, of the Eleusian benediction with the following words. Blissful is he who, after having beheld this enters on the way beneath the earth. He knows the end of life, as well as its divinely granted beginning. Cicero, also the famous initiate, set about the splendor that fell upon him upon his life from Eleusis. Not only have we received the reason there that we may live in joy, but also besides that we may die with better hopes. How could the mythological representation of such an obvious occurrence, which runs its course annually before our ever eyes, the seed grain that is dropped into the earth, dies there? proved to be such a deep, comforting experience as that attested by the cited reports. It is traditional knowledge that the initiates were furnished with a potion, the cucumber, for the final ceremony. It is also known that barley extract and mint were ingredients of the cucumber. Scholars of mythology, like Karl Kereni, are of the opinion that the Kikion was mixed with the hallucinogenic drug. I was associated with Kereni in the 60s, doing research on this mysterious potion, 
an investigation as to what kind of hallucinogen could have been contained in the Kikil. A reference of this collaboration is made in Karenny's book, A Uses, which was published 1977 in New York. And it is from that text that the preceding statements on the illusion mysteries were taken. Later in the 70s, I was again engaged in the investigation of the hallucinogen in the Kikion. This time I worked in collaboration with Gordon Watson, the famous ethnomycologist with whom I had worked in the research on magic plant, Mexican plants, the psilocybin mushroom and old Yupi, and Carl Ruck, professor at Boston University, who was, a, who was a classical scholar specialized in Greek ethnobotany. We published the results of our studies in the book entitled The Road to Eleusis, which was published in 1978. In that publication, we put forth the hypothesis that the Kikil's effect could have been due to an LSD-like preparation of ergot. From investigations in the Sandoz Research Laboratories on all the various species of ergot fungus, I knew that ergot growing on the wild grass Paspalum visticum, which is widespread in the Mediterranean region, contains the same alkaloids that we had found in the ancient Mexican drug or Lupri namely lysergic acid amide and lysergic acid hydroxy amide, closely related to lysergic acid thiocyl amide, well as deep. The high priest of Eleusis had access to this hallucinogen just in front of the temple. He just had to collect the infected grains of pastolonisticum, growing there, grind them, and put the powder into the cocaine in order to have a perfect hallucinogenic potion. If they really did so, of course, must remain a hypothesis. But the hypothesis with a high degree of probability. And Demeter was a goddess of grain. The cultural historical meaning of the mysteries of Eleusis their influence on European intellectual and spiritual history can scarcely be overestimated. The hallucinogen of the Kikion may link these mysteries with the role of LSD in our time. What we urgently need now is evidently the same as was already needed during antiquity. Namely, to be free from an experience of reality in which the individual feels himself to be separate from the outer world. We need to be healed from a dualism which had and still has such catastrophic consequences as expounded in the preceding reflections. Insights into the essence of reality, which I tried to provide using the transmit-receiver metaphor, could help us to overcome this dualistic worldview. However, insights that are solely the result of rational reflections are not effective enough to become decisive factors in our lives. Only when accompanied by an existential, emotional experience do they grow strong enough to be able to influence and alter our view of life. Such an emotional confirmation of an insight of the truth can be achieved 
through meditation. As is the true importance of LSD, the criterion of our time in its ability to provide a pharmacological aid to meditation aimed at the experience of a deeper, all-encompassing reality, a reality in which the outer material and the inner spiritual worlds, transmitter and receiver, are experienced as one. I thank you for so much.